Thank you so much for joining today's webinar, Healthy, Happy, and Hybrid, How to Build a More Connected Workforce No Matter Where They Are. My name is Chelsea, and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager here at Flexit. Before we get started, I do have a few need to knows. This webinar, this session is being recorded and a recording will be sent out to all registrants within the next couple of days. To, the, to make this really interactive, there will be a Q&A at the end of the discussion. So please feel free to enter all of your questions in the question box at the bottom of the Zoom, and we will get to as many as we can. And lastly, there will be a quick survey at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to fill it out so we can can continue to make these sessions better for everyone. Now we'd like to introduce our incredible panelists for today. We have Justin Turetsky, who is a founding team and COO here at Flexit. We have Ruth Penfold Brown, who is a coach, teacher, and fractional CPO advisor, and formerly a director of TA at Shazam. And Ebenezer Samuel, who is the head of training innovation at Flexit and a fitness director at Men's Health. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Justin to start the conversation. Welcome everybody, and thank you for joining. Our um, webinar today will last around 35 minutes and then we'll have about five to 10 minutes for questions. So you can leave uh, questions throughout the uh, panel discussion and we can either address them live or we can gather them and, and discuss them at the end. So we'd love to have you interact with us during this session and to get your questions answered. And of course, afterwards we'll follow up with a recording and you'll get this additional information um, about either um, becoming a Flexit Enterprise Partner, or if you'd like to for your yourself or a loved one or a coworker to try Flexit's direct to consumer platform, which I'm going to talk through in a second, uh, you can do that as well. So again, thank you for giving us a little bit of time uh, from your afternoon and I hope you uh, have some really good takeaways and we have really great um, panelists uh, joining alongside us today. Um, for this, for this really interesting topic. So to set the stage, I wanted to just talk through some stats that we found to be particularly interesting. And it's something a lot of people have felt or discussed, but going into the fall, it's very curious to see um, the companies making large announcements about people going back to the office. It seems like the fifth or sixth or seventh time where we've seen you know, these Fortune 500 companies making these grand announcements about you're never going back to the office or you have to go back to the office. Um, there's been some companies like one of our Flexit partners, American Express, that has been hybrid for many years and their employees are back in the office two to three days a week. And then we see other companies that says everyone back right away. And then there's another COVID spike and that changes everything. So, um, you know, it's curious to see some of the, the latest statistics and there's articles and headlines very frequently about this topic. And it's very interesting uh, to see how the, the COVID-19 pandemic had really shown employers that in some cases, their team is incredibly productive and they save a lot of costs and expense um, by letting employees work from wherever they, they need to. And then other companies have felt the, and came out with the exact opposite, which is it's not as secure and there's additional costs and concerns and concerns about retention and productivity. So it seems like we're hearing all kinds of different things from all sides. But we're not gonna just discuss hybrid today, hybrid work, but we're gonna talk about hybrid appropriate employee benefits regarding fitness and wellness and some of the benefits around that. And Ruth, um, and she'll cover her background in a little bit more detail, um, is the people's chief people officer. And she's, she, she advises and works with all kinds of companies and has a really great background in early stage companies that have, been acquired by very big companies and building out teams, which I think you'll find her insights to be very helpful. And she has a lovely accent. So, you know, Americans always think that, you know, she's smarter, I'm sure. And then Ebenezer Samuel, who's been programming fitness for the nation for quite a while at Men's Health and is a very trusted fitness and wellness advisor for Flexit and has helped spearhead a lot of products, um, uh, enhancements to our product around innovation. So let me get into the stats. So just I'll talk through these and I wanna get just a little bit more about your background, Ruth, and your reaction and then add right after. So the first is 55% of employees wanna work remotely at least three days a week. That's more than half, the majority of employees surveyed. 84% of companies said that employee health and wellness was a very important consideration in coming up with a work plan. 
9% of people who were able to work remotely during the pandemic physically relocated during the past two years. So nearly 10% of people. And I don't know if you've seen some of those stats, but New York and California had population drops. <laughs> Texas, Florida, Tennessee, uh, Arizona, to name a few, and Colorado have had really big population spikes. In some cases, thousands of families are relocating on a daily basis over the last few years. So there's been a shift to some of these lower tax states, maybe states with more nature, more space, and pretty good internet, I think. And the last stat is 80% of employees whose employers engaged in their wellness say they enjoy work. So not necessarily implied causation, but when your employees, employees are communicating with another, have accountability through third party platforms or fitness and wellness programming, they're more likely to see success and therefore are happier. So if they're making progress in their job, that's one thing, but if they're making progress with their health, both physically and mentally, that's another big win for that employee and shows that you know you really care about them, not just for their productivity and how they will perform as an employee, but you want them to be healthy. You want them to be happy because if they're unhappy and unhealthy, they may be looking for changes and that could mean leaving um, their jobs or making a change in their lives that, you know, that maybe your company doesn't allow for them to be the best version of themselves physically and mentally. So Ruth, I just want to get your thoughts on any of these stats. And if you could just tell us a little bit more about your background. Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you, Justin. I'm very excited to be here with you all. You probably can hear, I do have a bit of a different accent, but <laughs> probably not that rare. You've probably heard a British person speak before. <laughs> So look, I've been in the people space for about 20 years and I've built and rebuilt teams um, within organizations, within technology businesses like Shazam, British companies like Onfido that you may or may not have heard of. And through that, I've really understood firsthand the struggles of what it means to scale an organization and help it to thrive in lots of different conditions. I now do that independently through my own company, Pancakes and Peacocks, because having built a life for myself that actually does feel joyful. I know it's possible to create that in organizations. So I made it my mission to see whether I can help businesses to really create that for their people. But to come to your stats here, Justin, I think the thing is, is companies were created many, many moons ago because we needed to do things like bake bread, right? Practical things. Whereas now companies are created for different reasons and people's reason for wanting to be part of companies has, has changed too. We want more from the companies we work for. We want to feel good about ourselves when we're there. We're realizing what it feels like when we don't feel good about ourselves within a company. And to talk about hybrid just, just briefly, it works really well when you design for it, but it can also be a nightmare if you don't, right? So if you're really intentional about the way that you craft your culture, your organization, and the kinds of offerings that you have for your people, um, then it can be incredibly powerful, particularly in the way that maybe you bring people together and your opportunities for doing so, as well as supporting them working from where they are. So, I mean, I, I'm excited about where we are from a world of work perspective right now, and I'm keen to see where we go next. Cool, and Eb, um, just your high level responses and thoughts to this and a little bit more about your background, please. Yeah, so um, my background is, um, I don't have an accent very sadly, but I've been hearing you talk, Ruth, I wish I did. Um, but I, um, I'm the fitness director at Men's Health. I'm also a um, CSCS uh, trainer. I've presented a lot of kind of fitness information before the NSCA, and I wound up speaking on a lot of podcasts. I'm also, um, on, I've served on the advisory boards for Essential Waters. Um, I currently serve on the advisory board for Opt Health, which is um, kind of an, an online um, platform for general health. So I have kind of, I definitely look at it, Ruth looks at it from a corporate standpoint, and I definitely look at it from a person to person standpoint. I've definitely, as Justin said, I kind of program for the nation and that I'm the guy who um, creates all the workouts for men's health um, in multiple levels in our magazine, on video, um, everything that goes on our social channels, everything that's that's there is 
kind of put out for me. Um, in addition to that, I wind up training a lot of kind of my own clients. So I've worked with Terrell Owens. I've worked with Antonio Brown. I've worked with Marcus Ware, just to name a couple of guys. I wind up with a lot of NFL guys because I have a very heavy athletic background. Um, but at the same time, I've also trained, you know, firemen and police officers and moms and pops and execs. So I kind of have that. I try to look at it from a... Um, a personal standpoint. That's where I'm going to come at from this. It's interesting too, because um, as we said, it is a very, very exciting time. I'm definitely one of those people among the 55% who, um, who work remotely. And I think what we have is we have an exciting time. And we also have a time where there's, there are a lot of things in flux and you see it in the numbers, 55, 84% of, there's just a lot of change happening. And what happens when there's change, there's, there's when you're moving, when your job is changing, the way things are going, et cetera. Um, and you can't really rely on certain things. You can't rely on the work schedule. You can't rely on, on other pieces to kind of hold your life together. The one thing you can control and the one thing you always have is your body. And I think what I'm seeing in a lot of clients, what we're seeing in a lot of our readers at Men's Health is they want to take control of the one thing that they have, especially as we kind of creep towards that R word recession. People start thinking about, well, I can take care of myself. That's actually a discussion I had with somebody earlier today. And as there's all this change, I think the importance of taking care of yourself, of your body, of being in control of your health and fitness gets that much more important. And I think that's kind of the point where we're, where we're headed to. And I think that's what this discussion is about right now. Awesome. Thanks for that uh, response there and telling us more about your background, Ab. All right, Chelsea, can you pull, pull that screen down? Cool. So just in ahead of um, our discussions, I want to just give a quick overview of the Flexit platform um, so you get an idea of what Flexit offers directly to consumers, but also what Flexit offers to enterprises. So just a brief commercial here. So let me just go through this really quickly. So um, after logging into Flexit's account, this is what it looks like. So Flexit has um, live one-on-one -on -one sessions from a variety of different modalities that you can work directly with a trainer and nutritionist physical therapists and other specialties to meet your goals. And most customers will take one, two or three sessions a week. So that's four, eight and 12 packs. So we've recently launched achievements. Um, you can chat directly with your trainer. Um, you can order nutrition, nutritional products as well as equipment. Uh, you can also track your progress on your health profile. And then for enterprises, this is an example here of what our enterprise solution looks like. Um, this is just a basic version of just simply classes. Um, you can search by different modalities that can be specialized towards that partner brand. And then it flows into an on-demand workout library that belongs to you, your team, and your company. So it could be specific. And th these classes are going to be tailored to the specialties that you would select. Um, we can work together on based on demographic and fitness level of your team. And we can offer a wide variety across numerous time zones. So we work with companies with eight or 10 offices, for example, and be able to cover any time zone so that people have least access to cl multiple classes a day. And then you can level up with personal training sessions with the instructors that you've worked with. And I wanted to just show a, a new design here for some additional features we'll be rolling out on our enterprise platform. So you can see here, it still has the main elements, but now community is more a key piece of this experience. So um, you, you can see here that there'll be a ranking of the amount of times uh, and sessions and classes that different clients and colleagues of yours um, have participated in. And you could also see the recordings in a more searchable, uh, easier to navigate library. And then within this, um, there's more account management and communication among people um, on your team so that they can be even more engaged with the platform. So cool, that's just a high level introduction there. So I wanna ask my first question to, to Ruth. So how, how do employers um, empower their uh, employees to prior, prioritize their own health, just as a high level? What are some ways mm. that companies can do that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, it would be remiss of me not to say that wellness is an inside job, right? So we can't, as employers, force other people into their own wellness journey. But what we can do is provide them some inspiration to start to be think about what their own path might be and to start to think about what they might need in their own toolkit um, but the other point that i really need to make is as employers your culture can either support that or override it so any work you do on well-being 
um, can be completely sort of smashed to bit pieces by the energy of your leadership team and the way that they approach things. So the, the leaders have to lead by example, particularly with wellness. They have to show the employees that it's actually okay to have boundaries. Um, and they really can't be in cognitive dissonance. So that's where we say one thing and we do something else, right? Because there's many employers, and I see this all the time, saying, yes, we prioritize your wellness. And then when somebody tries to do that, they, they sort of smack it down, right? So, um, they, and there's nothing that erodes culture faster but because as humans, we spot this kind of dissonance really easily. And then it creates this kind of mistrust in us. And we're like, okay, maybe I'm not safe here, right? So, so yes, absolutely. Giving people exposure to stuff will help to empower them, but our culture has to enable them to say yes to that. Yep, totally makes sense. And I guess, Ab, from your perspective, a little different, you know, you've worked with pro athletes and beginners. So what, what are some of the differences in how you train them or how different levels should train? And can you tell us a little bit more about your experience uh, training clients on the Flexa platform specifically? Yeah, I'll actually start because I think there are a lot of similarities. I'll go the other way. I think there are a lot of similarities between kind of the pro athlete and, and the average person that, that we don't think about. And that's just basically they have goals, right? They have, they, and they don't know how to do it by themselves. The one thing that surprised me about pro athletes, I remember growing up, I just assumed that, you know, Michael Jordan, um, Justin Tuck, Eli Mang, all these guys I kind of grew up watching, that they just out of the womb happened to have their big bench presses and run blazing 40s and they could dunk a basketball. Um, and then when I started working with athletes, I realized that, no, these guys don't necessarily know the exercises they're supposed to do, the lifts they're supposed to do, they don't necessarily know the correct form for how to execute. Just like a regular person, they need a little bit of help. That way they can have longevity as athletes in their sport. So I think fundamentally, um, both both regular people and athletes, one, they can benefit from Flexit, and two, they um, they need the help of a trainer and they're seeking the help of a trainer. The difference is is in the goal right? The average person wants to lose, you know, 20 pounds or wants to, you know, get in the best shape of their lives to take off their shirt at the beach, right? So it's a little bit of a, um, it's more of a beginner goal, right? Versus, and so I'm, I'm trying to get them, I'm trying to get you if you're an average person, like the first 80% of the way, we have a lot of work to do in terms of the basics, right? The, um, the athlete, a lot of times athletes come to me and they essentially say, I want to get a little bit faster. I'm already very fast because I'm a pro already, but I want to get, I want to shave a 10th off my 40 time. I want to add five pounds to my bench press. I want to get, you know, that end percent better moving laterally. And so what we have to do then is I have to be a little more choosy with the motions that I'm choosing, the exercises I'm choosing, because I'm trying to get them that last 1%. And that's, I think the difference is just the style of goal that the um, pro athlete wants or the regular person wants. The great thing about Flexit is that I am able to train both because I can see everything I need on screen and I'm able to give the correct cues and the details that I need to the pro athlete. But at the same time, I can do that for the regular person. And to be honest, training on Flexit, I think has made me a little bit of a sharper trainer just because I can't be there with, you know, when I have an athlete in person, I can very, very easily just demonstrate something to them on the fly, but I have to, um, just pay attention to little things. I have to communicate a little bit better. So I think to be honest, like any trainer that's on flex, it really benefits and becomes a better communicator for the client. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm, I'm curious, um, cause you, your, your garage is pretty famous, uh, from, from Instagram and from men's health at this point. So what's it like training clients from there when they're in a different location, what are some ways that they've made use of whatever they have available and do clients always train at home or are they often just in different places? I, I've trained clients in, in a variety of places. In general, though, I feel like, and this is the one of the really cool points about Flexit. In general, a lot of them feel very comfortable training at home. They A lot of, especially um, exec types, they tend to accumulate a lot of equipment and they have this really, really nice gym and they kind of don't really know what to do with it. So I've actually been greeted by some um you know, I turn on the I turn on the screen on Flexit and I look on the other end and I'm like, as famous as my little garage gym maybe, I want that gym because there's so much equipment. 
Um, and a lot of times, you know, people kind of accumulate a lot of that equipment, even athletes, and they don't know what to do with it. So they're asking for a little bit of of uh, direction. What I'm able to do from my gym, but I've also done it from other locations as well. But what I do from my gym is I have um, some pretty cutting edge stuff in there as well. So I'm able to kind of demo and show exactly what, um, you know, what, um, how the form should be and how to execute. And I'm able to play with camera angles. Um, it was interesting because I was training somebody on the flexor platform, I believe on Sunday, and I've definitely gotten comfortable asking people to move me. I'll basically say, move my, move my screen so I can, I can see you from a different angle. And again, like that's stuff that didn't exist before the COVID pandemic, um, and didn't exist before we, we were in this world of virtual, but as soon as I say that, they kind of understand. And so we shift angles, they shift angles. Um, we're able to create kind of a lot of movement for them. Um, and we're able to, I'm able to, one thing that I'm, I'm able to do on Flexit that I think is different than training somebody in person is when I train somebody in person, I am training them in person and I wait for them to come back and they come back on say a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'm always training them, but on Flexit, I think because I have a certain reputation as a trainer, very often I can train somebody for one week and that helps kind of get them excited. Um, and they can carry that through till the next week or till even every other week, they're able to carry through a lot of what we do. And I'm able to, this is something I really love. I'm able to empower them to kind of, I'm training them, but I'm able to empower them to take care of themselves and do it by themselves, which to me as a trainer, as much as I want to train you forever and keep collecting money forever, I really want you to learn to do it by yourself because that is sort of the secret to true wellness when you get to the point where you can execute it by yourself. Totally. And, and I guess Ruth, having heard some of Eva's experience, I mean, semi unrelated to flex it. I'm curious when you're working with your clients uh, in the HR and people professions, they ask you, do I need a virtual wellness perk or a hybrid wellness perk? How do you, how do you respond to that? Well, I mean, I think it depends on the structure of their structure of their organization, obviously, and kind of what they need. But I mean, I think, I think my, my response is yes, you do. Um, but only if you're actually creating a culture that supports it. Right. Otherwise, you may as well save your money and just just accept that you're probably going to overwork people to burn out. <laughs> right. So I think providing they're actually willing to walk the talk and mean it, then absolutely. Yes, they that I would love all organizations to be actually designing for this stuff. And what I love about Flexit is that it offers the opportunity for, I guess, that more sense of personalization, because as I alluded to earlier, it really is an inside job. So it's down to the human to figure out actually what works for them. So if, for example, some of the things we were doing early on in the pandemic um, within companies was like, hey, everyone can attend this yoga class. Well, that's great if that's what you want to do, or if that does, you know, for some people, the idea of yoga fills them with horror. But if that's the only thing that's on offer, then I'll just not do it. Thank you very much. So I think I think the more that we can start to really embrace people as individuals and give them the space to figure out a path that works for them then we actually will stand a chance of creating companies full of people that are actually thriving rather than just surviving yeah and, and what do you see companies doing that have a lot of these incumbent programs because i've heard from different em employers they've made a lot of changes whether that's like, like a financial credit or reimbursement to get their own products or services because just giving a discounted gym membership that's next to HQ just doesn't really make sense anymore. So I'm curious what you're seeing that some employers have done to make adjustments for their now hybrid workforce. Yeah, well, and I think I think that's that's really important, right? Because people aren't designing for hybrid most of the time. So I'm really encouraging people as often as possible to do that. Because the way that we do work right now is designed around workspaces and we're not in workspaces anymore. So we need to think about how we communicate, you know, how we build things, what, what are the different things that we have available. But we also importantly need to create collision moments and that's opportunities for humans to come together and see each other as human beings. So if we can actually create a blend that, that means that, you know, maybe it is that they have a sort of flexible, um, flexible benefit that they can choose to pay for whatever it is that works for them and certainly in some of the smaller startups many of them would just say you can expense 
a class a week or something like that, right? As their kind of nod in that direction. Um, but I'd like to see and encourage companies to go a bit further and think about when they're actually creating those collision moments and bringing people together, how might they use that as an opportunity for inspiration for people? So perhaps that's the time where you know you give them a talk on something that they've never heard about before you get them to do breath work together and they realize that it's not as horrifying as maybe they thought right um and so so starting to sort of explore and give people the opportunity to try things that maybe wouldn't have occurred to them but at, but at the same time respecting the fact that they're an individual who might hate yoga <laughs> and i think we lost justin but i think he might be back <laughs> I'm here. Yay. <laughs> yeah. No, so, so, um, yeah, my, something's uh, got a little iffy with the Wi Fi there. Don't um, worry. But cool. All right. Good. But I, I heard, I heard all of that, uh, which is great. So, I guess in addition to coming up with these hybrid programs, I, I think some people might be wondering, well, am I really going to make a difference in my employees' lives? So, I'm curious, Eb. You know, if so, if a client came to you and says, "How long? How long does it take to see results?" How do you answer that question? Um, I I always answer it very simply. Um, whatever you think, however long you think it's going to take, be prepared for about two months longer than that. Um, and so I think very, very at a fundamental base level, a lot of the messaging on fitness used to try to tell us that you can get in shape, you can have abs, you can have the art, you can look like a superhero in thirty days, and that's just not possible. Um. In general, I would say the minimum it takes to kind of see results, and this goes from everyone all the way up to the pro who wants to drop that tenth of a second on his 40 to the average person who just wants to, um, you know, lose 20 pounds, it's going to take at least three months, right? And that's not just for kind of the result, because what we're really, what I'm really trying to train into you, if we're trying to reach a very defined goal, is I'm trying to train into you the long term habit, right? And it takes about I believe there's actually research that says it takes about 90 days. You have to do something for that long in order for it to become a habit. But if we can do that, right, then I can not only get you to your goal of losing 20 pounds, but we can also stay there and we can keep the 20 pounds off or we can keep the muscle we maintained or we can keep the speed. I think that's kind of the big goal. So at minimum, I would say 90 days. If you have a really, really dramatic goal, I would just say be prepared to spend two months longer. Fitness too, and I think wellness too, it should be about goals and it should almost be about micro goals that you're setting along the way, but it should also be about the long-term lifestyle as a trainer and also kind of in my role at Men's Health. I, I want people to get to the point where they're kind of embracing the lifestyle because that's how we all kind of live longer, um, live more fruitfully, and we just have kind of better lives both at home and at the office. Totally. And, um, and Ruth, I want to just turn it back to you and just get, get your response to that, but also how, you know, seeing progress and results, how that might tie into employee retention. Like, does that ever come up with questions about how do I retain my employees and how do you see fitness and wellness is tying into it? Oh, it's huge. And, you know, adding, adding some other, you know, like the most highly engaged people are the often the most prone to burnout, right? Um, the most highly, uh, highly engaged, highly productive people. Um, and so anytime that you're, anytime that you are allowing those people to burn out, you are obviously removing the magic of that person from your organization for however long that that's going to take to get there, right? So there's a very real business case for making that shift and for making sure that those people are supported. Um, and resilience uh, is a bit of a buzzword in the startup community. And there was quite an unhealthy under, like, definition of resilience, which is that you can just handle a lot, right? If you work in startup, you can handle a lot. People are going to bring stuff your way, you know, and, and, and startups really do pull in that kind of energy. Um, where I, I encourage people to redefine resilience. And, and I think a better definition of resilience is knowing yourself well enough to know what you need in your toolkit to be able to thrive and then when you're when you're struggling or under pressure which all of us are at some time we know what to do right whether that's phoning someone that we need to phone whether that's a class that we need to go to whether that's that we're going to meditate or something like that and and i think for companies 
um, that means giving people the right opportunity to build their own. And, and that's really the biggest thing. That's really the biggest thing that, that any company can do. Just to, kind of, I'll go ahead, okay, please. Yeah, just, just to add on to that too, I think another thing happens when, when companies kind of embrace fitness and when there's a, like fitness is about community to some extent. And I think you kind of see that like with, you know, CrossFit before the pandemic, CrossFit was huge because it was a group, right? And then when we go into the pandemic, all of a sudden there's kind of this explosion of these apps that all kind of invite um, community. And I think one kind of underrated aspect of that, yes, like the bodybuilder is going to go to the gym and train by himself. And even that he's going to wind up with a lifting partner at some point, but we all kind of crave um, a level of kind of community while being physical and being on kind of a team. And I think when you kind of invite fitness into the workplace, you invite that community, even if it's, especially as we're remote, it gets really, really hard to kind of get to know people and find that interaction point as some people work from home, some people work from the office. But if you're kind of all, you know, on the same app, doing the same workout, you know, all kind of investing in your health, it becomes another way that, that people can bond that is kind of natural. And also again, ingrained because we're working on these habits and trying to build, um, a long-term sustainable fitness plan. And that becomes, a, so I think the community aspect um, can also help community work too. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, Eb, in your experience, because you're often writing and covering all kinds of new technologies, what have you seen, um, how have you seen the hybrid world impact what's hot and new and working for people in fitness and wellness? It's basically gone. It's basically gone full tech, right? If you look at right, and I kind of use the pandemic as a very good uh, demarcation point for where we started to shift our view of how fitness was happening, um, and what the cutting edge of fitness looked like. Before that, I mean, you had Peloton, but still, it was people in CrossFit boxes. Um, it was people at big box gyms, and again, it was kind of. Um, about that community in those settings but then what we've seen since then is people have moved away from the gym or they don't want to have to go to the gym all the time so you've seen the rise of the home gym on some front right and that can be again that can be the exact like i'm dealing with who has a ton of equipment in an awesome gym that he probably purchased during the pandemic and he hasn't really completely figured out how to use but then i think the other half of that is kind of the rise of tech and an ability for people to train but again find that community um, and find a way to be connected. So we've seen kind of the rise of, you know, Peloton exploded, got even bigger, right? And you have a whole ton more kind of fitness apps that connect you with a trainer. And, and I think what we, I don't think we're ever going to leave that age behind. The other thing that that's done is it's changed like the way that people perceive a trainer and the way that people understand that they can interact with a trainer. Because there was a point where if I wanted let's say Justin wanted to work out, right? He would find a trainer in the area where he lived in, in Manhattan or, you know, in New York City. And because he had to go see that person, that, that person in person. But I think now what you have is you have this world where I can live in New York and I can, or Justin could live in New York and he could want to work with a trainer from California. And there is a way to work with that trainer in California, or there is a way to get that particular therapy. There's a way to connect virtually. And so I think what it's done is it's kind of globalized how we approach fitness. And in doing so, it's changed it to, I want the very, very best fitness for myself because I can get that even if I live in the middle of North Dakota. We have higher aspirations for fitness. We want to be connected and we want to do it with the very, very best equipment we can get. Cool. And Ruth, I'm curious, in addition to the fitness that, that I've been covering, um, what about nutrition and, and mental health? How have we seen that change in uh, employee benefits? Um, well, I think I think that the pandemic was was also quite an interesting moment on that front, right? Because suddenly, um, you know, people have been. I mean, we've been doing talks on nutrition and encouraging people to in that direction for a little while. But what I would say is that um, wellness really became front and center when people, certainly in the UK, we couldn't leave our houses, right? Um, and I know, I think in New York, we probably had a bit of that too. Not across the, all of America all of the time, I know. But, um, but, you know, that changed how things work. So 
people who hadn't cha- hadn't tried things like meditation before, suddenly it was like there was a little bit more of a leaning in from companies and from humans to maybe, okay, let me see, maybe see, let me experiment with this thing. Because it's also, uh, and to, to Eb's point, it's more available, right? I, you can actually, you know, you don't have to be in a specific place. I don't have to take myself to a meditation class. I can actually just log into a Zoom and I can be there and doing it. So so I would say that um, there hasn't necessarily been a, a radical shift in what the offerings are, but I would say the most radical shift is the availability of the offerings and and people's readiness to try different things and employers realizing just how important uh, employees' well-being is. I'll, I'll say this too, I think just to kind of piggyback off what you said, Ruth, I think what we've seen on the, what I've seen from the fitness side is it used to be like fitness and you went to the gym and maybe you did that, right? Yeah. And you function and maybe you ate right. And then mental health, it's like maybe you meditated, right? Right. Um, now we've kind of been able to put all those together, I think because for two years, um, the health, health was the number one topic and the first thing that showed up on your TV screen um because it's all about covid and so all of us now instead of kind of ignoring our health kind of understand that it's important and because of that i think fitness nutrition and and mental health have all kind of become lumped into one conversation and now you have kind of this conversation about wellness which is a far more accessible idea than fitness yeah um and so i think just the way we talk about it um the fit person needs to have them needs to needs to be mentally you know all there and needs to have their nutrition on point and i think kind of having that all dovetail together um just creates another creates another opportunity because the workout may not appeal to me the nutrition may appeal to me that may be a little bit easier on my head um or the mental may appeal to me but whatever i'm still getting in the door and at some point because the conversations cross over so much if i come in if mental health gets me in the door to start taking care of myself, I'm going to eventually touch those other two temples. Mm, Yeah, and I'd also add the structure into that, right? So I think a big part of of wellness for someone is supporting them to structure, to be empowered enough to structure their life in a way that works for them, where possible. I appreciate in some jobs, you have specific hours, you have specific things that you need to do, but for most of us, we do work better at different times of day. And we are, you know, we are all built slightly differently. So encouraging people to become experimental and try different things and see what it see what it means to actually build a life for yourself that can support you no matter what, right? Um, and that's really important. And Ruth, how would you respond to the skeptic who would say, I'm their employer, I give them a paycheck, they have a job. Why well, don't need to worry about all this stuff? It's not my business. How do you respond yeah. to the wellness skeptic? Employer? Okay, I've got something actually, because someone gave me a brilliant example of something um, just earlier this week. So four, four of the chemicals that we produce in our bodies when we're in love are the same ones that we produce when we're in flow state. Now, when we're in flow state, that is when our brain is operating at its absolute best. And there was a chap called Steve Kotler, I'm reading it to make sure I get it right. And he tested this by giving folks those chemicals whilst doing a puzzle. And he recorded a 500 to 700% increase in creativity in each person that he gave those chemicals to. So if you want to build a company, it's essential that you're gonna give your, you need to be giving your humans those love chemicals. <laughs> that sounds awful. I don't mean it like that. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. you want them in flow state because when they're in that state, that's when they're going to innovate. That's when they're going to do things and help take your business to places that it's never gone before. Yeah, it's interesting. Did you buy it? <laughs> you do. I mean, it Are creates you <laughs> the, the productivity, the team building. Because yeah. people spend a lot of time in, at work. You know, hours are longer. We're more connected than ever, especially with hybrid work. I mean, people are kind of always on their phones or computers, especially. You don't have that, like, go to the workplace, log into your computer, and leave. That's what it was when I started my career, for the most part, with Blackberries in the mix. But that was really what you do. You went to your office, you worked, and then you came back. And it's yeah. very different now for the modern workforce. So, you know, if you want to integrate with more people, they should also be a part of 
making them happier, health, healthier. So you can come with that because if they're really busy, they might not have a lot of time or the know-how to do it on their own. So it's a good way to say, hey, if you need our help, we're here. And of course, they're not mandatory programs. So it's just an opportunity and an offer to really, you know, reach a hand out and say, you know, I want you to be happy and healthy. Um, so we've had some fun things here at Flexa. You know, we within our team, uh, we had we had a fit club where people were taking sessions and having weekly check-ins to communicate that. And like I shared, we have platforms that companies and enterprises use either for their customers or their employees to offer, you know, fitness and wellness live sessions, which include classes. That classes that content then recorded, and then live one-on-one -on -one sessions if the employer wants to um, offer that to their their um, employees as well, and then other kind of cool ways to engage and interact between employees. Because for me personally, I did something. I worked in the, the big law world earlier in my career, and we had a, something called Fit Club, which was actually the first time I ever dealt with a trainer. But this was all in person at the time, and I think I've been really inspired to create a similar community. Um, but we can do this virtually and be able to span eight, 10, 12 offices and numerous time zones and kind of create that level of community. You can't really replicate in the same way and say, hey, we're all going to meet in conference room 8B for a yoga class. And most people are like, well, I'm not there today. It's not one of yeah. my offices or I'm, I'm in the West Coast office or I'm in London. So um, those changes, it's, it's really we shouldn't just say, well, forget it. You know, you're on your own now. It's, it's, let's be creative. Let's be different. So oh, I guess before we jump into questions, um, that's what any uh, any uh, parting words or anything you you meant to say and you didn't, Ruth. Um, before we open up the questions, then same same for you, Ev. Yeah, I don't know. You know, no. I mean, I think I think uh, like it wellness. If you're if you are an employer, uh, building out your wellness offering for your humans is a no brainer. You know, if you want to create, particularly if you want to be building a technology business or something that's innovating and creating something else, the way that your humans feel and importantly, the way they feel about themselves when they're with you will be the thing that will take your organization from maybe good to great. So that would be, you know, like it's something that you simply can't ignore. Ruth took that from the, uh, from the obviously from the, from the pinnacle right and i'm going to take it from a very uh, base level um from the bottom just so we kind of hit all the angles um but i think at a base level um and this goes back to a, a there's an old sports cliche the best availability or the best ability is availability right like if you're not injured if you can get to the office or you can do your job right um then on some level in sports you're winning and i think it's similar from a corporate perspective if if we can make employees healthier via better nutrition via um meditation via going to the gym so that your ligaments and tendons are healthy so that you're not sitting at your desk with a giant pain in your neck that you have to um that you have to stop for and you have to go take an advil and you have to go lie down or you have to leave the office if we can make employees healthier they're going to have an, we're we're creating the the chance for them to be more productive and for them to reach the levels that Ruth is talking about so i think on a very very concrete level if you can make your employees healthier and give them the tools to do that you can avoid injuries and you can avoid days missed and um that's going to make it it's we don't think of that because we've moved away from being that industrial society where if you have an injury and you can't go out on the farm there's a problem right but that, by the same token even when we're in the office um if you can if you can be healthier you can focus on your work a lot better and you can probably work longer too because you're not going to need to sleep as much you're going to be able to stay a little bit more relaxed and all of those things i think are important considerations um as you think about how you build out your wellness program awesome Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Eb. And then Chelsea, we have a few minutes for questions. So let's rattle off a couple of those. Awesome. Well, great job, guys. This was such an interesting conversation. And there's a bunch of questions that came in. Um, we can probably combine two into one. It's, it's probably mostly for Ruth. Um, what is the best way to get leadership to invest in these kind of programs? And how, what is the best way for someone maybe who's more of an influencer in a company to present these kind of benefits and ask for them? Yeah. So, I mean, if you're that person in your organization who feels like something isn't right, I want you to just feel secure that you're not the only one, right? If you can feel it, then other people can feel it too. And I would ask you to 
embrace, I don't care if you're leading others or not, step into your leadership energy and start talking about it, right? So, so do your research, find out why it's, it might be important for the, like put a little business case together and then think, who do I need to, who do I need to influence around this? If you want to contact me, I'll teach you how to do stakeholder mapping so you can figure out what they want and what they don't want. And then you can be really strategic about it. Um, but I mean, I think there's also books like How to Win Friends and Influence People that give you great insight how to win people over into your way of thinking. But I would just have faith that what you can feel, other people can feel, which means that what you think is a good idea, I can almost guarantee is going to be a good idea and certainly will be welcome by at least some of the other people in your organization. Awesome. Um, Justin, this question is probably for you. The programs that we were talking about, the enterprise Flexit um, customization, can are those just one size fits all? Or are they able to be customized per company? So if someone wanted to come in and have Flexit as a benefit, is it just one size fits all or is it um, for each company? Yeah, um, we have versions that are more out of the box, which we make reference uh, recommendations to the kind of program that you can set up, also depending on your budget and timeline. Um, and then we also do highly, highly customized projects. That almost recognize that our the Flexi platform in any way, shape, or form. So I've really done the full gamut of straight out of the box versus very customized. But we'd want to work with you and your team to figure out what your goals of the program are. Um, how long we wanted to run it. Maybe you could run a pilot to kick it off or a fit club that helps to get engagement across um, your team to kick things off. And we can highly customize it to align with your goals and budget. So if you're interested, Chelsea will share more information um, with you about how you can connect with us and, and maybe dig in a little bit deeper. But yes, very custom, no problem at all. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, Sorry, I'm just making sure. Uh, there has been access to health and wellness for many people for many years, but many people still decide to pursue, um, didn't decide to pursue healthier habits. So how should companies present unique access to their own employees in a way that would make these benefits attractive? So I feel like this is a little bit for everyone. Do you want me to go? <laughs> uh, yeah, Ruth and Ab, because I fully understand that one. So go yeah. ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think really this is where leading from the front um, becomes quite important, right? Because there is no better advertisement for well-being than somebody who's actually well, right? For someone who's actually thriving, right? So if you are seeking to if you're able to do that for yourself then really by your by your experience you're then going right actually what is it I want some of that right that's the best influence that there is right um but the more that you can be um credible as a leader and the more that the more that you build trust then the the more people will be open to going you know what maybe I'll give that a go or maybe maybe I'll try that um, but like, like for any sort of skeptic who's not sure about something, you, you know, you can just sort of gradually um, give people like a little amuse-bouche, like a little taster of things to see whether it, whether it, and then if they, they might come back for more. And then if they do, then maybe you can do longer sessions or something like that. So, I mean, I would just, I would just experiment, right? It's going to be different in every organization. Uh, people are going to bite to some things and not others. But if people don't bite to one particular thing that you've done, don't be put off, try something else. Um, so, I mean, that would really be, you know, it's it's giving people the opportunity to try things. Yeah, I think um, I completely agree with, with Ruth. It's, it's, it's about giving people the opportunity. Um, and I think fundamentally right now, yes, for a, for a very long time, people didn't kind of take advantage of the chance to pursue healthier habits. But we're in a very different moment now. We're again, two years of staring at your news channel every day and seeing COVID-19 pandemic, which basically reads as I need to take care of my health, right? So take advantage of the opportunity now. There's some immediacy in that 
for for this moment, for the next couple of months, for the next two years, people are taking, you know, anytime there is anything, anytime monkeypox comes up or whatever, it is fundamental in front of us because of what we just went through. So that creates a different opportunity in a different environment than what we had a couple of years ago. Um, beyond that, I think there are two things and they're kind of at divergent ends. But I think one, they're kind of at divergent ends because they exist in different ways. One, I think you want to be able to give people variety. So when when you had, you know, office buildings in Manhattan, they were like, hey, join the gym. You can join our gym. That's one option, right? And at the beginning of this conversation, we started with talking about multiple options because not everybody wants to go to the gym. Some people want to do yoga. Some people want to do uh, strength training. Some people want to run. So by giving people options, which is something that Flexit presents, that's one way that you can help get more people to do it because they no longer feel constrained that this is the only fitness that is acceptable to my company. So I think that's huge. And then on the other side, it's the other thing I've mentioned a couple of times today, and that's community, because on some level, we are more free and more disconnected from each other in a general sense. And so when we can create different pockets of community and we can use fitness to do that because it's very natural to be corporately active, then we're going to draw people into fitness. So by creating, and again, I know those two those two ideas to the very opposite ends. It's like, let's give people variety. Let's get them doing something together. But if you can find that magical nexus, which again is Flexit kind of serves as that in a couple of ways. If you can find that magical nexus, you win the game.